we're going to talk about, uh, actually come back from our discussion of uh, the Debro number and time scales and relaxation times and get back to glass transition temperatures. So one thing about glass transition temperature, TG, um, you've probably dealt with different uh, types of transitions before. So melting temperature is one example of a transition. Um, so again, specific temperature, free energy to liquid phase, lower than the free energy to solid phase, that leads to melting. So melting, melting is a first order thermodynamic transition. So first order. What does that mean by a first order TD transition? Well, it means if I take the derivative of Gibbs, I'm going to, uh, and I kind of plot this function, I will see if I take the derivative of Gibbs with respect to, you know, some variable, um, I'm going to see a discontinuity. So if I look at, you know, some parameter, for example, we're going to talk about DSE soon. So DSE, you're plotting heat flow, uh, delta H, so versus temperature. This is the first derivative of Gibbs. So when you see a melting transition, you see this spike, this discontinuity uh, in the heat flow versus temperature. But uh, the glass transition temperature is actually not strictly a thermodynamic, um, uh, well, the glass transition is not therm strictly thermodynamic, uh, it's this kind of kinetically trapped phase. And actually, it is a second order, so TG is a second order phase transition. So what we'll see here, um, when we undergo our TG, uh, let's say we have a semi-crystalline polymer, heat flow versus temperature. Uh, you'll see basically this change in slope. So for the second order phase transition, we'd see a discontinuity in the second derivative of Gibbs with respect to some variable. So there you would see this discontinuity up here. But uh, for the first derivative of Gibbs, you'll just see a change in slope, and then maybe the material melts later on. This is endo because we know melting is endothermic. Exo here, endo here, exo here. More on that a little bit later on. So. The melting point is thermodynamic in nature, um, but the glass transition is not strictly thermodynamic. Um, it's not a stable thermodynamic phase. It's a second order phase transition, uh, and it is a kinetically trapped phase. Um, basically, that comes from these large energy barriers that face is uh, basically because the glass can't, again, it has a very, very long relaxation time. It can't adjust to uh, kind of perturbation. So the glass transition um, is going to depend and reflect the kinetics and time scales of our system and our experiment. Um, and actually, this TG is not easily defined, and it will actually depend, and we're going to see in just a second, or not in a second, in the next video, that it will depend on the cooling rate. Um, so you need to kind of vary, again, this is going back to kind of a previous video, we need to know the processing history of our polymers in order to really trust these values. So when you look at values of TG, we need to know what was the cooling rate or heating rate there. So let's look at it. Uh, Think about the glass transition temperature from a free volume perspective. So um, free volume, this should not be, uh, this is not excluded volume. Very, very different. Free volume is basically the, uh, the space in your polymer in excess of the volume present in a random densely packed glass. So essentially, this is just the extra volume in your system that monomers can uh, sample or access just based on thermal fluctuations, KT. So it's just this extra volume when your polymer is kind of in this spaghetti, this kind of volume that your polymer can kind of wiggle around and bounce and uh, kind of access there. Uh, that's in excess of, uh, basically again, it's this volume or space in excess of the volume present in a kind of random densely pa um, packed glass. So in a liquid state, what do you think about the free volume? Well, it's going to be a lot higher, obviously. Liquid state, higher temperatures, uh, larger free volume, uh, larger temperatures, larger thermal fluctuations, uh, the free volume is going to be high, and, you know, again, that polymer is going to be able to fluctuate and, again, easily respond at, you know, in the liquid state, your relaxation time is going to be very, 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 very small. So you can respond to those perturbations, and you're able to respond to it because there's more free volume that the monomers can move in. Again, as we pull our system, they can rearrange uh, as your system expands. But in the glassy state, free volume is going to be very, very, very low. Uh, and again, it's going to be hindered by these, you know, steric uh, included volume considerations. Again, there's not enough uh, thermal energy to kind of fluctuate and access uh, those kind of free volumes. And instead, that free volume, instead, you're going to be kind of constrained by those excluded volume effects. So we can define the free volume of a system like this as a function of temperature. Because obviously, as we just saw, it will change because 
it is the volume that monitors can access via thermal fluctuations. So higher thermal energy, the higher thermal energy, higher free volume. Uh, and so we're going to see that in just a second. So V naught, volume of a closely packed random glass. V temperature, Vf is going to be our free volume here. Um, and the temperature dependence uh, comes from again this. You know, hopefully you've seen this in material science before. Your thermal expansion coefficient. So alpha is just going to be one over your volume divided by or multiplied by the change in volume dv dt as a function of temperature. So as we increase temperature, more volume in your system, you know, again, your material expands. Unless you have a material with a, typically almost all materials have this value of alpha. There are some interesting materials like titanate, which have an alpha of less than one, but uh, that's a little bit a discussion for ENG 45 uh, lab in a little bit. So uh, now, the thermal, uh, if we want to kind of look at how the free volume is going to change as a function of temperature, we need to kind of consider that uh, this thermal expansion, we're going to have an alpha in our liquid phase and an alpha in our glass uh, phase as well. So it's going to be different between glass and our fluid states. Or again, glass or liquid or rubbery states you might see in different literature values. But one thing we do know is that alpha of our liquid or our rubber is going to be greater than alpha of our glass. So. Again, that just kind of makes sense. Again, there's more, again, your material is going to change. Uh, there's going to be a larger change in volume for temperature when you're in the liquid phase than in the, uh, that glass phase. So uh, we can uh, basically write this expression and kind of plug in, uh, uh, basically say that, again, our, you know, the change in our volume, V naught, so remember, V naught is the volume of our closely packed random glass. That is going to change depending on, uh, again, it is going to be dominated or governed by the thermal expansion coefficient, that difference between the glass and the fluid. So we need to kind of rewrite uh, that expression. So this, uh, the liquid state is greater than the thermal expansion of the glass state, and this will control the increase in V naught uh, with T. So we plug in there, and you could basically get a graph that looks a little bit like what we're going to see uh, in a little bit. And if you divide out by V, you could uh, basically reduce everything in terms of uh, basically the volume, uh, the fractions, to the total volume. This is sometimes called the specific volume as well. And we're going to look actually, uh, actually, let's look at the graph right now. So forget about the cooling, uh, fast and slow cooling in a second, but you can see that you can get a graph. Let's just draw it over here. So our TG is going to occur when, so what's the volume, temperature here, and so you have here, here. Where that discontinuity occurs, because again, volume, second derivative, uh, this is not the second derivative of Gibbs, uh, it's the first, so second order phase transition. Tg, the slope here is going to be governed by, the, let's see, rise and run, the alpha of your liquid or rubbery phase here. Below Tg, you're a glass, so alpha of G, and that just comes from, you know, this equation here, as long as you kind of normalize by your, you know, your volume. But again, it's essentially related to that. The key thing is, Tg is going to be where that fractional free volume falls below some critical value, and it's where, again, the slope changes. Um, so below our critical value, our monomers are basically frozen in place because low um, free volume available. Again, the free volume is, again, that excess volume. What can we access? So at low temperatures, we have, uh, again, lower free volume, as you can see by kind of these values right here. Um, but so polymers with, uh, and then, again, at high temperatures, higher free volume. Now, polymers with greater uh, free volume in the fluid state should experience a lower glass transition temperature. Um, why is that? So let's think about that for a second. Polymers with greater free volume in the fluid state should have a lower glass transition temperature. So TG should move to the left. So I have a if I have a polymer that's very, very flexible, I can access, you know, let's say I have some like silicon, Again, like I could have a hydrogen. Again, I don't know if this is a trick, but you know, silicon is a very flexible kind of chain as well. Uh, actually, if we if we weren't carbon-based life forms, we probably would be silicon-based life forms. But anyways, um, so why would a polymer with high flexibility and greater free volume in the fluid state experience a lower glass transition temperature? Well, uh, again, you're going to have to decrease. You know, it's very very flexible, so it has lots of extra free volume. 
So to kind of freeze, you know, and again, reduce, you know, to get to this below this kind of critical value where the monomers are frozen, I'm going to need to lower temperature even more. I need to freeze that guy in place because these still want to wiggle around. Why? Because our thermal fluctuations or our, basically our epsilon ij, like we talked about previously, are very, very low, you know, essentially lower, you know, for these very flexible uh, polymers, you know, similar, but a little bit distinct. So for a very flexible polymer with high free volume, uh, this thermal fluctuations can cause, or, you know, we're going to have to lower our temperature a lot because uh, these polymers can kind of wiggle out into place. So we need to decrease our temperature more, reduce the free volume fraction to that critical, uh, critical value here. So again, because there's more free volume originally. So there's less, or, you know, you can think of it from the opposite sense. Um, it's going to require less thermal energy. Your TG here is going to be, you know, it could be like minus 123, like silicon um, polydimethyl siloxane, silly putty. Um, it's going to be very, very, like, you know, you just need a very, few, you know, it's going to be a very, very low glass transition temperature, PDMS, because, again, those polymers are very flexible. They get access free volume. Um, so there's going to be less thermal energy required to kind of access this extra free volume. So your KUT thermal fluctuations are going to be much less. So your glass transition temperature will be lower as an effect, you know, uh, as an effect. So uh, you can kind of start to see, and we're going to get to this a lot in detail in uh, not the next video, but the next video, that the glass transition temperature will depend uh, a lot on your molecular structure of your polymer. So a little bit more uh, on that a little bit later on. So we can also approach this, and we mentioned that uh, your glass transition temperature is not only a function of kind of the molecular structure of your polymer, but on, sorry, but also on the, not only on the chemical structure, but on the kind of kinetics of this reaction, specifically how fast or how slowly you cool. So we're going to get into how does that come about, and uh, we're going to touch on this idea of percolation theory uh, in a bit. So if you haven't seen that, it'll be a, a really nice and kind of fun uh, discussion. So we'll see you all next time.